Hi, everyone. This is Julie, the cancer dietitian, and I see a bunch of you in here. So I am actually going to um, get us started pretty much right on time. Um, I am going to use my headphones so I can make sure to hear kind of what's going on. But if you have questions, there is a chat box. Um, and I guess you can use these little emojis on the side too. But if you have questions as we go along, I will try to keep an eye on that chat box to see what kinds of questions you have. And I do encourage you to ask questions because it does make it a little more interesting for me if I know what you um, are most interested in or if there needs to be some kind of clarification um, about the content that we're covering today. So... Let me get these on so I can make sure that I'm ready. Um, so this is an interesting topic that I have not actually covered in the past in terms of webinars or even usually in um, the regular um, classes that I teach because it's honestly not something that comes off comes up very often. But now that we're in the time of not wanting to get infected by things, everybody seems to be interested. So I thought that I would cover the basics. Um, I do have a question coming in about how to mute the phone. So every person who's attending um, should be muted. So that shouldn't be a problem. Um, all, all attendees should be muted. I can't actually hear you. As far as I can tell, I don't know if you can hear each other, but I cannot hear you. Um, but you can chat in your questions. Um, and also, you can use the emojis to let me know what you think. Thumbs up, thumbs down, clapping. You know, those are the ones that I want to see a lot of. <laughs> um, hey, there's a thumbs up. That's so fun. I don't know if you can see it, but it flies across the screen. Um, okay, so... So we're going to get started. We are covering kind of a variety of things today. So I want to make sure that you know that this is what we'll cover. And if there's something you need more of, I am expecting we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So I'd love to be able to answer questions at the end, but also open to having questions throughout. These are our goals. We're going to cover Food Safety 101 because what I've found just in discussions with people most recently is that a lot of people don't actually have a complete understanding as to what things that we should always be doing in terms of minimizing our risk for foodborne illness. Um, to be honest, uh, as dietitians, we have to take a lot of foods classes as part of our required classes in college. Um, so we might be some of the more picky people when it comes to food safety and how your kitchen runs. But um, learning about all those things, you don't realize that our home kitchens are not even nearly as clean as restaurant kitchens. Um, if if we had health inspectors come into our homes and grade us the way that they grade the restaurants, um, I think you would be surprised by um, what grade you might get. So hopefully you'll, little, you'll learn a little bit of something about Food Safety 101. We are going to talk about special notes that people who are immune compromised need to pay attention to because people during treatment, especially when your counts are low or transplant patients and transplant survivors do need to pay attention to extra um, cautious recommendations. We'll briefly touch on what the recommendations are for cancer survivors after treatment. And then we'll also touch some on current evidence around um, COVID-19 and food safety, because there's been a lot of discussions about that. And I want to make sure you have the clear information, or at least what we know so far. Isn't that the challenge of today's um, current situation is that it feels like things change all the time. And so you're constantly having to adjust to what the latest information is. Um, but I've also found that people who have faced a cancer diagnosis sort of have a leg up on what other people um how they cope with challenges because some people have already had to spend a lot of time in isolation and maybe they figured that out um, or at least they have ways to deal with it. So 
We are going to talk, of course, you know, let's talk about me, um, which is always the most awkward part of lots of my presentations or when somebody else reads my bio. But the reason that I give you this information is because there's a lot of people out there who do give nutrition advice and they don't necessarily have the training um, to do that. And so I think it's important that you know that, that the source that you get your information from is at least educated in that area and is um, relying on evidence-based information. And so my expertise, I am a registered dietitian nutritionist, which means that I have to have a four-year degree from an accredited college that offers um, a, a credentialed program in nutrition and dietetics. So I actually have an undergraduate, a BS in biology from NC State University, which if you're not familiar with NC State, it is one of the land grant colleges in North Carolina, and we actually have a really strong food safety, um, very well known for our food science department. Um, so that's kind of a bonus for this particular presentation. But um, so I did a biology degree. And then to get my dietetics training, I actually went to UNC Chapel Hill to do a master's in public health. Um, so and then I have been working as a registered dietitian for almost so. Uh, gosh, it's 15, maybe more than 15 years now. And I am a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition, which means oncology is my specialty. Um, so anyway, in, in undergraduate, I did take a food microbiology class. And also in graduate school, getting my master's in public health, we did take you know, biostats and epidemiology and those types of things. So um, it it's very interesting how my training has sort of meandered its way around. And here I am talking about food safety and cancer. So we are going to start with um, food safety 101. And this just catches you all up on what are the things that you need to be doing at home to minimize your risk of foodborne illness. Um, and so this is what we say that food safety begins with you because you can prevent, even if something is contaminated, you can prevent that um, by doing some basic things in your home. So washing your hands and surfaces, these are so clean, separate, cook and chill would be things that are probably on dietitian exams. Um, and they're, I think, important things for each, for every household to be aware of. So clean, wash your hands and surfaces often separate. We say don't cross contaminate. We'll talk about what that means. Cook your food to proper temperatures, checking with a food thermometer, which I'm going to be honest, I am not great at using food thermometers. Um, so that's something that maybe I don't do um, very often at all. But I also do tend to try to just like cook the heck out of my food sometimes. Um, and then chill, which is refrigerate promptly. So first, when we talk about cleaning hands and surfaces, germs that cause food poisoning can survive in many places and spread around your kitchen. So you want to make sure that you're regularly cleaning it. Wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before, during, and after preparing food and before eating. And I feel like we should all be experts at washing our hands at this point because that's all we hear all the time right now. Um, but it is really, really important. And, and so I feel like we have a handle on that. What you might not be as aware of is wash your, your utensils, your cutting boards, your countertops with hot soapy water regularly. Um, hot soapy water is really honestly the best thing for cleaning. Um, it's better to you can use disinfectants. I guess that's the thing that I think sometimes people, they, you know, just quick wipe down their counters and then they use disinfectants. Well, disinfectants aren't going to clean your counters. They might sanitize or disinfect, but it's not necessarily going to clean it. So your best case is to clean the counters with hot soapy water, wipe them down, make sure they're nice and clear. Um, and then if you want to add a sanitizer or disinfectant on top of that, that's, that's a choice. And then rinse fresh fruits and vegetables under running water. This is another key recommendation that I think a lot of people uh, don't necessarily know because they have heard, oh, you can wash your fruits and vegetables with soap or you can use some of those sprays or you can use um, cleaners on them. Those are not recommended. The recommendation for cleaning your produce, your fruits and vegetables is to just use water 
you can use a scrub brush. I do have like a fruit and vegetable scrub brush that I use. Um, and then you can make sure that you clean the scrub brush. You can put that through the dishwasher or make sure that you're washing it really good in soap and water. But for your fruits and vegetables, it is not recommended to use soap. I did have somebody this week comment on my blog asking if um, baking soda was an okay thing to use. Um, and I have seen where there's recommendations to use diluted vinegar when you're rinsing berries, and that helps to keep the skin from breaking down. Um, so you don't have washed berries that are like falling apart in your fridge. Um, what I would say about those things is it's not necessary, you know, to use baking soda. The recommendation, again, is just to use water. Um, but certainly baking soda is something that you can consume. Um, so there's not risk to um, consuming baking soda, like consuming soap is not good for you. It, you know, your stomach is not made to deal with soap. And so the best thing is to use things that you can actually tolerate. So th that's the reason that I would say if you want to use baking soda or you want to use like a v diluted vinegar to rinse things off, I think that's fine. I am not a big fan of the vegetable sprays. Um, I, I certainly would not use like a wipe or anything like that to clean my vegetables. Uh, because again, you're going to eat those. Um, and you don't want to be eating, you know, the wipe. <laughs> okay. So your kitchen sink, hand washing is one of the most important things you can do. Scrub the backs of your hands between your fingers, under your nails. Um, keep your nails short. If people work in restaurants, they don't have long nails. Um, Wash fruits and vegetables before peeling them. This is something else that I think some people don't realize is things like cantaloupes, even onions. You should wash them before you start peeling them or cutting them into pieces. Um, because when you use the knife to take like, say the cantaloupe and you're cutting across, what can happen is if it's dirty on the outside, the knife can basically take it down through the fruit. Um, so we want you to wash them all. And then the interesting thing is we say, yes, wash your fruits and vegetables, but then don't wash <laughs> raw meat, poultry, or eggs, because that can actually spread germs. Um, you know, if you think about taking a raw piece of meat, putting it under the running water, and it splashes kind of all around and gets up in your sink and everywhere else. And so that's something that we say don't do. Um, and actually, the eggs was a good reminder for me, because I kind of hadn't thought about it. I usually rinse my eggs. So I'm going to stop doing that now. Um, cutting boards and utensils. Use separate cutting boards, plates and knives for produce and raw meat, poultry, seafoods and eggs. So sometimes that feels like common sense, but something people often do is take like meat out to the grill, put it on the grill, cook it, put it back on the same plate. Not a good idea. Um, and if you're cutting meat on a on a cutting board, you don't want to use the same cutting board to cut the fresh foods that you're going to eat, like fruits and vegetables. A lot of people actually use completely different cutting boards all the time for their meat and their fresh produce. And that way you just don't mix them up ever. Um, and then clean with hot soapy water or in a dishwasher if your cutting board is dishwasher safe. The great thing about a dishwasher is that the temperature of the water can get really, really hot. And that does help sanitize. Um, in restaurants, you know, they use these huge steaming hot um, dishwashers to clean things. And that does help disinfect and kill um, bacteria and other foodborne um, uh, germs. So those are things that it is better if you have a dishwasher safe cutting board to put it in the dishwasher. I have a hard time. Um, I don't use a lot of fancy cutting boards like the wooden ones. I know you can't put those in the dishwasher, but sometimes I have larger cutting boards and they just don't fit in the dishwasher very well. Like it hits the spinner um, if I'm putting it in the bottom part. And so that is a challenge um, that we usually have to watch the larger ones by hand, but it is nice to put the other ones in the dishwasher if possible. Separate, don't cross contaminate. So I mentioned this with the cutting board issue. Raw meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs can spread germs to your ready to eat foods unless you keep them separate. So here's a little picture here. There, you know, you don't want to be eating those lemons that are in this picture with the raw meat because they are cross contaminated. 
Um, use separate cutting boards and plates. When grocery shopping, keep your raw meat, poultry, seafood, and their juices away from the other foods, um, which is why they have those bags that are in the meat section so that you can keep it contained and the juice is contained and keep it in a separate part of your cart. And I would also recommend you don't put the raw meat like in the child seat section, because if it drips, it's going to drip on the stuff under it. So, um, and, and some of the grocery stores will use a different color bag when they package up, um, like refrigerated foods or meat. Um, keep raw meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs separate from all other foods in the fridge. We'll talk about this in a minute, but that's another really important thing that you can do at home to make sure that your food isn't contaminated. Cook foods properly. To me, this is one of the most important things that you need to do that many people um, don't always pay a lot of attention to. Um, so food is safely cooked when the internal temperature, so that's like in the middle of the casserole or the meat or whatever it is you're cooking gets high enough to kill germs that can make you sick. So there's this zone of temperatures that we call the temperature abuse zone. And that's the temperature between like 40 and 140 where um, germs are most likely to grow. And this is why we say you need your fridge to be below 40 degrees and we you need to cook your food to the proper temperatures and reheat your food to the proper temperatures because if you take a food item and it's not stored properly in the fridge and it's not below 40 degrees then germs can grow in it enough of them can grow to make you sick is what we're trying to avoid there are germs that are going you know they're just different places all around us all the time and we don't have to be afraid of them but when there's enough of them that it causes a full out infection that takes over, that's when we have a problem. Um, so the only way to tell if the food is safely cooked is to use a food thermometer. Um, and you can't tell if food is safely cooked by checking color and texture. Um, so especially if it's like a new dish that you're making, then you can check the temperature the first time. Most People, once they make the same thing over and over again, you don't have to check the temperature every single time. But if you want to be extra safe, you would use a food um, thermometer every day with every meal, especially people who are at high risk. It's a good thing to get um, used to using. So here are the temperatures. So when it comes to meats and um, reheating foods, 145 degrees in the middle for whole cuts of beef, pork, veal, and lamb. 160 degrees for ground meats such as beef and pork, 165 for all poultry, including ground chicken and turkey, 165 for leftovers and casseroles. To me, that is a big deal. A lot of people, I think they make the assumption that, oh, well, because the cook, the food is already cooked once, then it must be safe and I can just sort of reheat it to whatever temperature is right for my mouth. <laughs> and that is not the best approach to reheating. So I tend to err on the side of reheat the heck out of the food, then let it cool down to the temperature that your mouth needs to eat it. Um, it can be frustrating and annoying when you're just really hungry or you're in a hurry and you're trying to heat up your food and just get something to eat. But it is, it is important that you get it up over the 165 degree mark. 145 degrees for fresh ham, 145 degrees for fish, or cook until flesh is opaque. So that's interesting because um, they did, you know, the other recommendation is that the color can't tell you. So maybe with fish, it's a little bit easier to tell. So those are the temperature degrees. You can get a variety of different food thermometers. As long as it's accurate, it doesn't matter what kind you use. Like the one here is a, in the picture is a meat thermometer, kind of the old school meat thermometer. Um, but my oven, um, when I moved into this house, the oven actually had a built-in food thermometer, which is kind of cool. All right, the next um, is talking about the microwave. So we talked about reheating foods. It is important to know your microwave's wattage. Um, so check inside the door uh, or the owner's manual or the manufacturer's website, because lower wattage means you need to cook it longer. And the, and you should know that. I mean, I, I would figure you probably already know if you have a microwave that takes longer than what the directions say. But it is important to know that because if you don't 
If you don't cook it long enough, it's not going to get to those proper temperatures. Follow recommended cooking and standing times to allow for additional cooking after microwave stops. So I thought this was a really good tip is letting food sit for a few minutes after microwave microwaving. It allows those cold spots to absorb heat from hotter areas and cook more completely. So if you think about like a casserole that you're reheating or potatoes, I don't know why potatoes are always the hardest. Um, the microwaves actually cook, um, they cook certain like water molecules differently. And so some foods just, you know, they get hot in a second and other foods take forever to heat up. And sometimes it's just a matter of it needs to spread out. Um, so giving it that time, I make this microwave broccoli that I get from Costco and it says on the package, cook it for five minutes in the microwave and then wait, leave it in the microwave for another minute. And so those are just good tips to make sure that you get hot all the way through. When reheating, use a food thermometer to make sure that microwave food reaches 165 degrees. I think I beat that one home. <laughs> So when it comes to refrigerating, keep your fridge at 40 degrees or below and know when to throw food out. I think people don't always throw the food out. If you're like me, you don't like to waste food. I hate the idea of throwing food out. But when it's past its time, it needs to go. Um Sniffing it is not good enough to tell you if it's good or bad. Uh, there, I'll show you a chart as to when to throw foods out. But basically, to make sure that you chill or keep it at proper temperatures, you need to refrigerate perishable food within two hours of cooking it. So sort of the classic example of foodborne illness outbreak is a family picnic or a church picnic or, you know, just to get together where people bring food and share it and it sits out for a long time. And then if it sits out for a long time, it can gr grow excess germs and that's when people get sick. And so we say we need to refrigerate within two hours, but if it's over 90 degrees, which if you are one of my Winston-Salem <laughs> people, in North Carolina, it gets over 90 degrees for a lot of the summer. Um, really, it should not, it needs to be refrigerated within an hour if you're outside with the food. So really paying attention to those or have coolers so that the food can go on the ice as quickly as possible. Thaw frozen food safely in the refrigerator or in running cool water or in the microwave. Do not thaw your food on the counter. That is like a no-no food safety no-no because bacteria multiply quickly in the parts of the food that reach room temperature. And if you think about, I mean, the turkey is the classic example, people putting, or chicken, just sit the chicken on the counter and let it thaw, and then you're going to cook it. But what happens is the outside, of course, thaws first and the inside's still frozen. And then the outside's at room temperature for hours before the inside ever gets fully thawed, and then you have growth of bacteria and germs. So do not thaw your food on the counter. I know it takes so much longer. You have to put it in the fridge like a whole day ahead of time. Um, they, they also, I guess another tip is to try using an instant pot or a crock pot to cook um, foods where you could cook it from frozen and so you don't have to wait for it to thaw. A lot of crock pot recipes, you do have to thaw things, but sometimes you can use frozen foods in them. But the instant pot, you can take that food from the freezer, the chicken or whatever it is, put it in the instant pot, cook it. So that's a great way to do it with um, while also being food safe. All right, your refrigerator. You should, um, when you're chilling your food, let's say you make a big pot of soup. It will cool down faster if you divide it into several shallow containers so that they chill faster in the fridge. And the reason is the surface area of your food will touch more air and it will cool down faster. So if, if you put a whole pot of really hot food in the fridge, it's going to take a long time for the food to get cold in the center. And that's where our biggest concern would be is that something could grow in that temperature's danger zone because it's going to take so long for it to cool down. And that's why we suggest dividing it into um, shallow containers, put some in the fridge, some in the freezer, but somehow make sure that it gets to the right temperature quickly. What, how you store your food in the fridge is important as well. Store raw meat on the bottom shelf away from the fresh produce and away from your ready-to-eat food. So cheese sticks or um, other foods that you like cut up carrots or 
or other vegetables that you have ready to eat. You don't want them anywhere near the raw meat. Throw out foods left unrefrigerated for over two hours. So if you have people over and you've had, you know, food sitting out on the picnic table for a while, you want to go ahead and throw that out if it's been more than two hours. So you kind of have to keep a track, keep track of it. Um, and then throw or thaw or marinate foods in the fridge. We already talked about that. All right. So, oh, can you read that? I don't know if you can read that. Um Okay, so someone's asking, raw meat stored in a plastic bag above veggie drawer. That's a really good, it's funny because, is this a picture? I thought I had a picture of a fridge. Anyway, I don't know where it is. I thought I had one. But um, that is, I, that's a challenge because you have the drawer. I have the drawer too. So the bottom shelf is technically above the drawer. So I think that it is fine. Um, you just want to make sure that there's no possibility that if, water leaked out when the food, when the meat's thawing or um, when it's just sitting there, that there's no way it can get down into the drawer. I would guess that they're designed so that there couldn't, it couldn't get in there. Uh, but you want to make sure the meat's not like hanging over the edge. So then if you open the drawer, it could drip, drip in. Good question. Um, so I don't know if you can see the chart, but <laughs> Um, I, there's a link here and on the very last slide of the presentation, I'm going to put several different links and one of them will include this. Um, and I'll send that out to everybody who registered for the webinar. Uh, but as you can see on here, I couldn't get the whole chart on the slide. Um, uh, but when it comes to the refrigerator versus the freezer, the fridge, it's going to go bad. And so you need to really pay attention to when the food put it was put in there. Um, egg, chicken, ham, tuna, and macaroni salad. So those are the salads mixed with mayonnaise. They can be refrigerated to, for three to four days and then they need to be thrown out. Un or opened packages one week, unopened packages two weeks. That's of hot dogs, um, which I think a lot of people think, well, hot dogs never go bad. They technically do. So um, deli meats, three to five days if it's opened or unopened two weeks. Bacon one week. So this is like the um, meat section, um, which honestly, when it comes to cancer nutrition, we don't tell you to eat them very often anyway. But if you're going to eat them, they should not get you sick. <laughs> um, so the other thing, though, I want to point out is it shows you in the freezer one to two months that it's good. Technically, from a food safety standpoint, the freezer will always keep it food safe. The challenge is that if it's past this one to two months kind of mark, it can start to degrade the actual food. And so the food doesn't taste good. Freezer burn. That's what happens. Your food gets freezer burn and it, you know, those frozen vegetables with freezer burn on it, they're just not the same. So it's best for you to get through the foods that are in your freezer. Don't let them sit there too long, but they are technically food safe if they've been in the freezer. The fridge food, though, you really need to pay attention if you need to write a date on it. Um, and the interesting thing about like egg salad, chicken salad, tuna salad, um, a lot of people think it's the mayonnaise that is causing the, the foodborne illness. It is not the mayonnaise. Um, mayonnaise itself is shelf stable. The reason you have to refrigerate a mayonnaise jar is because once you stick the knife in, there's a possibility that you could have gotten some kind of bacteria in there and then it can grow if you don't refrigerate it. But it's not the mayonnaise that brings bacteria into the picture. It's usually the other item or the other things that you're putting into the salad and then it can grow. So somebody's asking, do you trust the site stilltasty.com for how long food lasts? I don't know. I am not familiar with that site. What I would tell you is if they're pulling their information from like the CDC or the FDA or the USDA, then yes. And usually places that are talking about food safety, they are pulling um, from those charts. So I would check on that. Good question. I'm glad you guys are interested in this topic. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, as a biology major and a food person, uh, I just think it's very fascinating. Um, and, but it uh, doesn't always make us the most fun people at, you know, the potluck either. 
All right, so this was this was also interesting. Ten common mistakes. So this, I think, this came from I think it was the CDC or the FDA has a foodsafety.gov website. It might have come from there. Um, but mistake number one: eating risky foods if you're more likely to get food poisoning. So we'll talk about that next. Is those who are immune compromised? What are the risky foods? Mistake number two: not washing your hands. So some of my friends are like, why are we all out of soap? Why, why is there no soap anywhere? As if people weren't washing their hands before. <laughs> but we are all hyper aware of washing our hands. So make sure that you do that. Um, number three mistake is to wash meat, chicken, or turkey. Don't wash them. Just go ahead and cook them. Cooking them will kill the bacteria. You don't need to wash anything off. Mistake number four, peeling fruits and vegetables without washing them first. Something that actually I thought about with this is that I have a toddler, so he doesn't do well with the skin of the apples. And so we skip, we cut off the skin of the apple and I'm like, well, we wash it before we would eat it, but I can't quite, I'm not sure if we always wash it before we peel it for him. So that was something that made me think. Mistake number five, putting cooked meat back on a plate that held raw meat. Um, Mistake number six, not cooking meat, chicken, turkey, seafood, or eggs thoroughly. So making sure that you cook them all the way through. Mistake number seven, eating raw batter or dough, including cookie dough and other foods with uncooked eggs or uncooked flour, which is another interesting point that um, I forgot about, is that flour itself can have some bacteria. And so eating raw flour, Eggs is not the only risk when it comes to the cookie dough um, or batter. It's also that flour needs to be cooked before we eat it. We made this week, um, you know, since everyone's enjoying lots and lots of time at home, we made um, salt dough where you take flour, salt, and water. It's basically making Play-Doh, but you can roll it out and we made little like Easter ornaments um, and painted them, dried them in the oven and painted them. Um, but my kids, of course, are like, oh, this is dough. Can we eat it? And um, that was something that was, first of all, it wouldn't taste good. So that was easy to tell them no. But also remembering that the flour itself shouldn't be eaten raw anyway. So no, you shouldn't eat homemade Play-Doh either. <laughs> um, Melinda is asking, so I can't eat over easy eggs. So you can, you just have to recognize that it's a little bit risky. That's all. I eat over easy eggs. To be honest, I really like to eat cookie dough, but it's not wise. My husband will not eat it ever. He will eat over easy eggs. Um, so you have to decide if that's a risk you're willing to take is what it comes down to. And when we get to the end of the webinar today, we're going to talk about how to balance these risks because some risks are worth it, right? I, I also talk about bacon being that something that we know lots of processed meats can increase your risk for colon cancer, but a lot of us, you know, love the taste of bacon. So how do we balance that risk? Um, so I would say your over easy egg is, is sort of a risk thing. Um, it's not the same as eating full out raw egg. Um, but if you're in a place where you feel like you're immune compromised, you might want to make sure it's cooked really well. Um, mistake number eight, tasting or smelling food to see if it's good. Yeah, that happens all the time, right? Um, especially milk tends to, you smell the milk to see if it's good or bad. As soon as I have to ask myself if I, that I, if, if I feel like I need to smell it to see if it's good, it's generally probably time to throw it out. Um, in my household, my husband might still eat it, but I just I just can't do it. If I think it's bad and I have to smell it, it that's a goner. Mistake number 10, leaving food out too long before putting it in the fridge. That's another, of course, a really big one for temperature. We call it temperature abuse. Okay, so what is food safety in an immune compromised kind of situation. So let's talk about who is at high risk. Anyone can get food poisoning, obviously. I mean, a lot of us, you know, have had food poisoning before in the past, but there are certain, certain groups of people who are more likely to get sick and, and to have a more serious illness when they are sick because their, ab their body's ability to fight germs and sickness is not as effective. So this includes adults age 65 and over, 
I feel like we're picking on them a lot these days. I'm sorry. There's nothing you can do about getting older. And there's nothing you can do about the fact that as you get older, your immune system gets less efficient. That's just, that's why. Okay. Um, Children younger than five years old, people with weakened immune systems, we'll talk about which aspects of cancer makes you have a weakened immune system and then pregnant women. So a lot of the recommendations that we give for for, um, cancer patients in treatment are the same things that we give the recommendations we give to pregnant women because pregnant women have lowered immune systems because their bodies are more concerned about taking care of the growing child. So people with active cancer, meaning you have a diagnosed cancer currently, are more likely to get a foodborne illness because of the weakened immune system. And then cancer treatments and the disease process of cancer make you more susceptible to types of infection. So during chemotherapy, there will be times in your treatment cycle when you're at increased risk of infection. And usually your medical team is really good about telling you that. Um, So they would tell you, oh, you know, a certain number of days after your chemotherapy, Um, your counts might get low. They want you to sort of stay away from crowds. They want you to make sure that um, they used to kind of talk to people about raw fruits and vegetables, but honestly, there's not a lot of great proof showing that um, avoiding raw fruits and vegetables when your counts are low actually prevent extra infections. So we don't say that as much anymore. Um, But certainly your team usually does tell you when you're at highest risk for infection. People with weakened immune systems are more likely to have lengthier illnesses, undergo hospitalizations if they do get sick. So to avoid this, you have to be especially careful when choosing, handling, preparing, and consuming foods. Doing all the things that we just talked about, essentially. You you have less room to kind of be risky is what I would say. So Melinda, for your question about the eggs, I think, you know, at this point, you're probably okay with um, risking an over easy egg, but maybe when you were kind of in the midst of treatments or when you were in a time where you knew your counts were low, you might not have been willing to risk it. Transplant recipients take drugs to suppress the immune system. And so that's, um, you know, they're necessary to take those medications, but you do need to be aware that your immune system is lowered and therefore you might want to be extra cautious. So uh, for people who have to take ongoing immune Um, suppressing drugs, then it becomes a lifelong kind of commitment to minimize risk of foodborne illness. It becomes your your lifestyle. Um, And also as you age, you know, your risk for infection goes up. So transplant recipients are the ones we suggest to select lower risk foods. Now, those of you who are on who maybe are in treatment or in a time of lowered immunity, this might be a time to select lower risk foods. Or if you're sort of in like a heightened sense of awareness about germs right now, then this would be another list you could sort of lean on if you want to reduce your risk. So first of all, I recommend pasteurized milk all the time for everybody. Pasteurized milk to drink, pasteurized milk to make cheese, pasteurized milk no matter what, um, because the pasteurization process helps to kill a lot of disease-causing bacteria. It's one thing if you milked your own cow in your backyard, but the any possibility of finding raw milk in in most of our societies right now is going to be a long distance from where the cow was milked, which means much more likelihood of um, growing foodborne um, pathogens. And so what we want is get pasteurized milk. It makes it a lot better. Fully cooked meat. So no sushi. Um, Heat all meats. So even previously cooked meats or deli meats. Now the exception here is canned meat. It's okay to get canned meat and eat that. But if you're pulling like deli meat out of the fridge, you should heat it to steaming um, in the microwave. Use This is an interesting idea. I thought, um, you know, you can't use them for over easy eggs. But if you are making something like um, where, where it might not be cooked completely, or you're trying to make scrambled eggs or something, and you want to reduce the risk that there's any um, raw part of the egg in there, you can use pasteurized pasteurized eggs or egg products um, when preparing for recipes that call for eggs. So like the egg beaters or whatever it is that they sell is usually pasteurized. Cooked vegetables and washed um, clean and fresh fruits and vegetables. As long as you rinse and rub firm skin fruits and vegetables under tap water, including those with skins and rinds that are not eaten. 
So fresh vegetables are fine. You just want to make sure that you scrub them really well to get everything off on the outside and then clean can lids before opening. Um, that would be soda cans or like canned fruits or vegetables or chili or tomatoes or whatever it is. Just make sure that you rinse off that lid. Um, you could wipe it off with a rag or whatever, a clean rag. Okay, so food safety for cancer survivors. Um, so this piece is a little, it's a little more fuzzy is what I would tell you. So cancer patients who are currently in treatment are among those at the highest risk of serious illness from an infection because their immune systems are weakened. However, this risk is typically temporary for when you're in treatment or when you're in those times of treatment where your immune system is lowest. Cancer patients who finished treatment a few years ago or longer have immune systems that have most likely recovered and therefore you're kind of at the same risk as the general public. And but the thing is, everybody's situation is different. And so when I say use common sense, if you're not sure, you can always talk with your doctor about your risk for infection. Like, hey, do I count as immune compromised or am I far enough out and pretty stable that I'm just at the same risk as the general public? I think that that's a fair question. So now we're going to move on to the food safety and COVID-19 sort of question. Um, so we need to talk about what the risk is. So we've gone through all this food safety stuff. So these food safety is something that we should all be practicing all the time. This is not like all of a sudden there's a new pathogen out in our society. And so now we have to worry about food safety. There have always been pathogens. Um, the challenge with the one now is that because none of us have ever had it, we don't have any sort of natural immunity to it. So, but with this particular respiratory illness, the greatest risk is respiratory transmission. So coughing, sneezing, breathing around somebody who is infected, um, recognizing that some infected people do not have symptoms. So you don't know if you're around somebody who is infected and you're just breathing their air, which is why we're all staying away from each other because we're sort of assuming, well, everybody has it, so I better just stay away from everybody until we know. Um, it is less likely or lower risk that we would get COVID-19 from contaminated surfaces. Yes, there's a study that's shown it can technically live on cardboard for 24 hours or plastic and steel for two to three days. So there is that data. However, we don't have evidence showing that people are getting infected because they touch a contaminated surface and then they get the disease. For you to pick up the disease from a contaminated surface, it, you would need to touch your face. Um, so this is why we say wash your hands all the time, try not to touch your face, which is even harder. Um, but really also the, the germ will break down over time when it doesn't have a host that it's living on. So that's why after 24 hours on cardboard, it's not like an active virus anymore. But even after two hours on cardboard, it's less active than it was before. So just your common sense is like, okay, this is breaking down with time. Um, so you could, some people are like, well, I'm just going to leave my Amazon package on the porch for 24 hours and then I'll go get it. Um, so those are some things you can do, but it's a very low risk is what the experts are telling us. So, and there's unlikely spread from food. And this is a quote from an NC State, go Wolfpack, I'm an alumni. Um, NC State professor of food science, the virus will not live long in food proper. So we don't have to worry about our food being contaminated with coronavirus and then us eating it and getting infected. It's not showing that that's, that's a problem. Um, and so while it's possible that food packaging, if you think about, okay, it can live on the food packaging from groceries or takeout, could contain small concentrations of virus particles, it's really easy to mitigate this risk by washing your hands after handling groceries or takeout. So to me, the common sense is let's all practice food safety. Let's all minimize the amount of time we get around each, each other. I think the biggest risk at the grocery store is not the carts or the food or the packaging. I think the biggest risk at the grocery store is actually coming into contact with other people. Um, so really paying attention to that. Um, this is what we know. There's no current evidence to support transmission of COVID-19 associated with food. So we say this is not a foodborne illness as opposed to things like norovirus, which is a foodborne illness and can cause severe diarrhea and vomiting. And those are the 
cruise ships, you know, nightmare stories that you hear prior to this current crisis is what you would hear about was norovirus, which is a foodborne illness. Um, so risk is low for transmission from food or food packaging. Takeout is currently considered safe. Groceries are considered safe. And you still want to use good food safety practices. So I did blog on this particular physician's video, which caused a lot of panic for some people about how they must treat their groceries. I think he went over the top in terms of recommendations for how to handle your groceries. I think we can all use a little common sense um, with this. So what do we know? Patients with cancer may be at greater risk for being immune compromised, depending on the type of cancer they have, the type of treatment they received, or other health conditions, plus their age. So the risk of being immune compromised is typically highest during that time of active cancer treatment. And there's no specific test to determine if you are immune compromised, which is why I say that, you know, a conversation with your doctor can help you maybe put you at a little um, more comfortable level in terms of understanding your risk. Highest risk diagnoses, blood cancers, cancers that are active and affecting a person's organ function. Um, so thinking about people with a history of lung cancer or if you're having any um, functional issues with your organs currently. Patients with a history of a bone marrow transplant are at higher risk. We talked about the transplant recipients needing to kind of have a lifestyle of lowering their risk in terms of food, um, food safety. And um, this was an oncologist that was quoted from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center when it when asked about, um, you know, cancer survivors and, and coronavirus. We don't know all the details on this, um, but if you've been told you're immunosuppressed by your provider, then you should be extra cautious. So that's kind of where we are. And I think a lot of us are being extra cautious. I'm being extra cautious um, because I think it's good for, for everybody if I can make sure that I do my part. So honestly, I'm not actually going to the grocery store. I can't, I think it's been three weeks since I've been to the grocery store. I am doing grocery delivery. Um, so somebody is going to the grocery store for me and I very much appreciate that. Um, so I give good tips on my grocery delivery. Um, but for me, it's just, it's easier. And I figure the fewer people in the grocery store, the better. So it might as well not be me. If the same delivery person's going in multiple times, then they can um, reduce the number of people going in. So the bottom line, the highest risk for people currently receiving immune suppressive treatment, as well as those who have active cancer and are not in remission, patients with a history of cancer who are not currently on therapy or don't have active cancer are probably not at an increased risk compared to other people in your age group. And hormonal therapies for breast cancer are not considered causing an increased risk. So I think some people have question as to whether hormonal therapies count as active treatment. In this case, we are not counting those as um, suppressing the immune system. So we are all currently dealing with this pandemic situation. Um, and I am trying to make sure that people feel like they have ways to take care of themselves and to be well, despite all of the challenges that we're facing. And so I've spent some time with a website for Cancer Services, which is the nonprofit agency that I work for, coming up with ways that you can stay healthy and well at home. So I've been sending out emails and updating our website for that. Um, I am doing more webinars. I'm working on some recipe videos and sharing recipes on things you can do from home. Uh, trying to help people make sure they have access to good, healthy food while they're at home and being physically active. I think for a lot of us, it's our sort of our mental health that needs an extra check and extra care. And part of that is just having to make decisions in a time that we've never had to do this before. And so I shared this on my most recent blog post is that, you know, all of us, like all the all of us here on the webinar today can get all the same information. So all the people who are listening just got all the same information from me, and they're going to make different decisions with that exact same information, and that's okay. And so what I want for you is to feel confident in your decision making. And um, I say that it's actually very similar to some of the other topics that I've covered when it comes to organic foods or how much sugar you eat or how much processed meat you eat or um, all these things are having to basically balance risks. We can't have a risk-free life. Um, we're all taking risks whether you want to acknowledge them or not. So I, I sort of broke it down to these four steps for how you can make decisions. And I would encourage you 
to make a confident choice for yourself um, and and to have peace of mind about your choice is that's our goal at this at this point. So first of all, make sure you're getting information from evidence based resources. So I talk about just because someone is a doctor doesn't make them an expert. Just because someone is a dietitian doesn't mean that they know everything, including myself. I don't know everything. So when you get information from people that you think are evidence based you should be able to drill down to their resources, which is kind of how I answered that question about the website um, that Holly asked about, stilltasty.com. I would want to look at whatever it is, the source that somebody asks and see what references are they referring to. Um, So I always try to point out where my references are coming from. It's especially easy on a website because you can just link it. Um, but especially today, I'll give you resources on the very last slide where you can go look up this information that I found. So as much as I'd like for you to think that I am so smart and came up with all this information, I'm just pulling it from the evidence-based resources. Number two, get your information from people in places that do not raise your blood pressure or stress levels. So the last thing we all need right now is to feel more stressed about the current situation. Um, we have a local physician in town who is an infectious disease specialist, and he has been interviewed a lot of times throughout our community and on our local news. And he has the best way of sharing the current information, just level-headed, very calm, not in a way that makes you feel like, oh, great, tomorrow we're all going to be out together again, because we're not. But it also isn't in a way where you're afraid of everything that's going on. He gives you the facts and helps you kind of work through what's going on so that we can all understand together how we can get through it. Um, So if you are like this particular video about how to clean your groceries, um, (laughs) the people who texted and Facebooked me were like, this is so crazy. Do I have to do that? That's overwhelming. It's causing me a lot of anxiety. And people who have um, diagnoses like OCD were just, it was over the top. And so I would say if you're the place you're getting information is causing your blood pressure to go up or your anxiety levels to get higher, find a different place for information like that's not the right source. Certain news stations tend to do this because it's going to get more viewers or Facebook groups or um, certain Facebook pages. They get clicks when they have headlines that are kind of scary or like to really draw you in. But I would caution you to stay away from those types of things because they do tend to cause more anxiety than we need. Be honest with yourself about what is practical. Okay, so um, if you have extra time and you want to wipe down all your groceries, that's fine. If you have lots of money and all you want to buy is organic food, that's fine but it is not necessary. Um, I even tell people canned fruits and vegetables are great for you and they can be a good bargain buy. Same thing with frozen. And so you got to figure out what is practical for you, your family, your meal plan, your budget, all of those things. Work within your, um, you know, the barriers or the challenges that you have and make a choice. You can feed yourself and your family if it's from a food pantry, if it's from the grocery store, whatever it is. Um, Work within your um, practical limits and then be confident in your choice in your choice today and be open to change. I mean, that's what we're all living in right now is just figuring out, well, for today, this is my choice. Maybe one day I wipe down all my cans and another day I just don't because I don't have time. So um, kind of giving yourself the freedom to change your mind and try not to guilt or push on other people to make the same decision you do, um, because we all really just need each other's support right now. All right. So my hopes for you, I don't even know what, okay. I'm pretty, pretty good on schedule. My hopes for you is that you have better knowledge about the evidence regarding food safety and cancer. So you can lower your stress, enjoy some food, enjoy cooking at home. Don't worry, be happy all by yourself. (laughs) Or, you know, if you want me to keep you some more company, I have lots of other webinars on my website. You can follow me on Facebook. I've been doing some Facebook Lives. Um, You can also join us on Cancer Services as well. I say keep calm and eat your vegetables because we know that's good for you. Um, And we want you to stay as well as possible um, during this time so that you can We say support your immune system, recover faster, and hopefully get back out um, this summer and really enjoy, you know, some of the things that we've been missing. So connect with me online, of course, cancerdietitian.com. 
And um, you can find me on Facebook, Pinterest, not very often on Pinterest, sorry about that, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Also, be sure to check out the Cancer Services website. That's where I put a lot of information about staying well um, while you're at home. Um, so be sure to check us out there. And let's see, somebody had a question. Do you still have to rinse pre-washed uh, salad greens? No, do not rinse pre-washed salad greens. Um, and why bone marrow transplant patient has more risk? Um, that's, I don't know exactly, except that it's considered a transplant. Um, it That would be an interesting question, depending on what type of bone marrow transplant. Um, and some other... You know, if you have to take immune suppressive drugs, that would be one thing. Um, but bone marrow transplant, because your immunity has sort of been switched over. Um, that's how I understand it. But for the salad greens, if it says it's pre-washed, the recommendation is to not wash them again. Because then you're adding any bacteria that was on your hands um, to it. Do you, do I have specific diet for survivorship and cancer patients? I do. And let me type this in here. So on cancer slash survivor diet, I have an email program where it will email you, um, once a week for eight weeks, I think with my recommendations for cancer survivors and hold on, let me look dietitian.com. I think I have a webinar on plant-based diets for cancer survivors. I was going to put that link in here too. It's a little bit, it's not super old. It's from hmm, a couple years ago, maybe. So I do want to redo it. And this might be a good time for me to redo it. But there's a webinar. I, and I put this all in the attendee chat um, for uh, survivorship and cancer patients. So to me, just FYI, plant-based diet doesn't mean vegan. It means that you eat a lot of plants, but you can still have meat on a plant-based diet. Oh, another RD. How exciting. Um, so yes, and I have a handout. I, I sell very few things because I work for a nonprofit and most of my website is just part of our programs, but there are some handouts. So for the dietitian who's at a treatment center, um, you can purchase, it's a downloadable, printable thing you can use um, that covers my recommendations for cancer survivor diet. And it's like $15 and you can print it as many times as you want. Let's see, in my store, um, here, I'll share that with you too. Oh, you saw it already. Okay. Uh, Melinda Cochran, can you still have cooking show online? Because I was supposed to have a cooking class this Tuesday. Um, and it was going to be cooking for two, which is, it's a fun, I, my cooking classes are really fun. I'll be honest. They are so much work that I'm kind of not exactly missing them, but I have considered how I can do them online. Um, so what I'm planning to do is do recipe videos or Facebook live. Um, Melinda, are you on Facebook? I can't remember, but, um, I can do, or YouTube live. I can do them on there. Uh, but I probably could only do one recipe at a time because usually my cooking classes were doing like three or four or five recipes and I have volunteers and all kinds of help. Um, I'd be doing them here by myself in my kitchen. So I am working on recipes. Uh, my On my list currently is my granola recipe to turn that into a recipe video. But yeah, I'm, I am hoping to do um, some more of my cooking classes virtually. Yes. Um, I don't know if I could do it on this, on this, um, platform, but I could do them on YouTube live and anybody could watch from there. Good idea. What else do I need to tell you? I do have a podcast. Um, I'll probably actually take the audio from this webinar and put it on the cancer dietitian podcast. So that will be great. And here is my list of recommended reading. I will email this out to everyone who registered for the webinar today. 
and I'll send out a copy of the slides. And once the recording is available, I'll send that out as well. Um, so if there's no more questions, that's all we've got for today. I really appreciate everybody joining. Thanks so much. And I look forward to catching up with you online again very soon. Thank you.